Well, uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to Selston Baptist Church. And uh, it's great to be able to, to kind of have to disturb uh, 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 lots of conversation uh, and, and warmth and uh, chatter. Uh, you're just really uh, welcome among us. This is a special uh, day in SBC uh, because we are joining together with Liam and Remy uh, and Amaya in dedicating Nala. Isn't that fantastic? And uh, we just want to say a particularly warm welcome to lots of friends and family uh, of Liam and Remy. So it's just so good that uh, we can do this today. You're really welcome. Uh, and we hope that you and, and all of us are encouraged uh, and built up uh, and drawn close to God as we worship him this morning. We just wanted to mention a uh, public service announcement that we, we realize it's hot today in case you, uh, you hadn't picked that up already. And there are, uh, around the, the window ledges here, there are jugs of water uh, and cups. Uh, we're not the Coldstream Guards, so uh, you don't have to keep going uh, and par through it. If, if you're feeling uncomfortable uh, and you, you need a drink, grab a drink. Uh, that's really important uh, to do that. But let's uh, continue, let's begin uh, our time together this morning. Let's worship our great God, and uh, DeWeek is going to lead us as we do that. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see your faces looking sun-kissed, many of us here. We thank God for the sun. If we could stand to our feet, we're going to begin in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you, Lord, for being with us, Lord Jesus. You want to speak to our hearts and minds today. And I pray that you will settle us in, in our focus, Lord, on you, Lord Jesus. Father, we want to be fed and watered, Lord. And we just imagine the flowers, when they're fed and watered, how they look so bright and lively, Lord. You can do that for us today. I pray, Lord God, that we will meet you in a, a wonderful way, um, individually and collectively as a church, Lord. Move amongst us. We invite you here. We invite your Holy Spirit to minister to us from the inside. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, alone, my hope is found.
returns or calls us home, here in the power of Christ we stand. Not in our own power. We have none. It is his breath in us. So we just want to acknowledge that and give thanks for that in our hearts. It's in his power that we stand. Amen. We're going to surrender all now to Jesus. And if you can think of anything in your mind that you know that you need to surrender to God, as you sing this song, as it ministers to you, I pray that you would just let go of those things, that you would let go of those things and make it a true surrender. Not when you walk out the door, you pick it back up again and you're gone on with your week with that thing, whatever it is. But right here today, in this service, you can let it go. You can let it go if you choose to and walk away different. Amen?
all my fears, all my doubts, all my anxiety, my depression, my sadness, my loss. I surrender it. I surrender it to you. All my habits. My confusion. My friendships that are not right for me. Jealousy, hatred. And anything else that might come to your mind to surrender. In this moment, know that God is loving and caring and welcoming of all that you hand over to him so that you can be free. I was thinking, some, some of us, we need to surrender our children to God. You know, we have a baby dedication and we're giving our children to God. But, you know, we, some of us have got children here and we worry about them so much. We're just so worried about them, what's going to happen with them, you know, how they're going to turn out. But we can also surrender them to God. Just give them to God and say, Lord, have your will in their life. So I just want to encourage us to, if we do have children or we know children, we can just put them before the Lord and say, you know, do what you have, do what you will do in them, in Jesus' name. Amen.
we love you so much and uh, we're just honoured. We find ourselves amazed. Uh, forgive us for taking things for granted, but we, we just think about what it means to be welcomed by you and loved by you and called home by you. And we're amazed. What a great God you are. How full of love you are. How full of mercy you are. And uh, for all your goodness to us, we're grateful. And we give back. And we pray that what we give would be used and taken and be a means of others coming home and others knowing your mercy and others being richly blessed. And all this we ask in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, uh, as I was saying earlier, uh, it's a really special day and uh, a joy and uh, a, a wonderful family occasion uh, that uh, Nala, we're welcoming you uh, particularly this morning uh, into God's people and uh, we're going to pray for you and give thanks and for mum and dad uh, and for my as well. So I don't know, Liam and Remy, can you join me? Now and I and Carol and Connie, I don't know if you'd like to... Uh, join me uh, as well. It's uh, wonderful uh, that you uh, are all here together. Well done. You're okay. Fantastic. Isn't this good? So friends, let's just remind ourselves uh, of what we're doing, what we're doing at this moment. In the name of Jesus Christ, we're welcoming Liam and Remy, uh, who are coming to give thanks with us for the gift of Nala. And Jesus was presented by uh, his parents in the temple. In turn, he took young children in his arms and he blessed them, he loved them. And we do that now. We celebrate the gift of life and the faithfulness of God and we covenant together. Uh, as parents, we make promises. As a church, we make promises before God for the sake of Nala. And here we share in joy over the gift of Nala, and we praise God, who is the giver of life. And we celebrate family life. We acknowledge that children aren't uh, the property of their parents, but named before God, they are persons with whose welfare and nurture we're entrusted. And concerned about the dangerous world into which they are born, and honestly aware of the sinfulness which will soon mar their lives. We pray that God will bless them and God will protect them and watch over them. And as well, we celebrate the importance of community and the truth that parents and children don't have to be alone. Uh, Liam and Remy, we're with you. <laughs> we're standing with you this morning. And we confess as well that all our hope rests in Jesus. We confess that the biggest thing we can hope for any of our children, for any of the people we love, is that they discover Jesus and they become his disciples. And look at Nala in, uh, in Dad's arms. Scripture calls us to see in Nala and in children a sign of the kingdom of God. So here before us is a sign that God loves us with our condition and lavishes love and grace on us and Lavishes love and grace on anyone who comes with an empty hand and an open heart. Amen. So we're going to hear some readings. And Zephaniah, thank you, because you're going to bring us the first reading from Luke's gospel. Well done. And then uh, Miriam's going to bring us a reading from uh, Proverbs. Thanks, Miriam. You okay? Come on. Yeah. You all right? You okay there? Well done. This reading has been taken from... Luke chapter 18, verse 15 to 17. People were also bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked him. They rebu rebuked them. But Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it.
follow that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. So I have a bit of a minor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Proverbs, chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. My child, do not forget my teaching. Sorry, my child, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Blind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all the ways you submit to him and he will make your path straight. So a prayer uh, and a prayer of thanks. And we come to you now and we just acknowledge you. We acknowledge you, gracious God, as the creator of all things and as the giver of life and as the one who is the loving parent of every person and joyfully we thank you for the gift of new life in the birth of Nala and for all that you've already given and all that you're going to give to us through her for all the possibilities that we see in the, the sort of template uh, the blank canvas as it were of her life we just thank you and we thank you for the love which has beckoned her into existence the love and hope she's awakened the care that surrounds her. For all of this, we're really thankful. And we give you our thanks and praise in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. So friends, we come now to uh, a moment when we make uh, promises uh, and commitments. And first of all, Liam uh, and Remy, uh, I have some uh, promises, questions uh, to ask uh, of you. So Liam and Remy, do you thank God for the gift of Nala, and do you accept the joys and duties of parenthood? We do. We do yeah. And do you promise to bring Nala up within the Christian community, and by God's grace, so to live that she will be nurtured by Christian love and surrounded by the, the, the love of Jesus? We do. We do. And uh, Connie and Carol, it's uh, wonderful uh, that you're here and uh, joining us also. And uh, a question for you as Nala's grandparents. Will you promise to love and help and care for Nala and come alongside and support Liam and Remy so that she can grow to know the guidance and the goodness of God? Well, wonderful. Thank you. And Amaya. Important question for you as well. You're okay. So, Amaya, will you promise to love and care for your sister as well? Yeah, well done. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. And can I ask you, Liam and Remy, what names have you given to your daughter? No. no. <laughs> Wonderful. Welcome, Nala. So, Nala, will you come to me for just a moment? Now look at Cassie Bruce. That's all right. Are you going to come to me for a minute? You all right, Nala? Good girl. You're going to come to me? Oh, well done, Nala. Well done. So, Nala, we, uh, oh, we have a question for you as well. Sorry, I forgot that. <laughs> okay, friends, a question for all of us as well. Gathered here as members of this congregation, and as representatives of the wider Church of God, do you promise to offer Nala and her family your love and support? And being faithful in prayer, will you share your faith with her by word and example? Oh, well, wonderful. So Nala, good girl, we rejoice for you are God's gift to us. And we pray, grow strong in the knowledge and love of God. We pray that one day you will be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And you'll follow him through the waters of baptism in a life of faithful witness. And that you will bear the fruit of the Spirit in your life. And that you'll bring love to many and receive love from many as well. As well as God's love. And so now that I pray... That the Lord would bless you and keep you, and the Lord would make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you, 
and that the Lord would lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace this day and always. Amen. Amen. Good girl. And now I just want you to look around for one more minute. These people are your friends and family, and you're a gift to them like they're a gift to you because you remind them that we must all come to God as little children with empty hands and open hearts. Well done. Good girl. It's been great, hasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Shall I give you back to Dad? Well done. Well done. Wonderful. Wonderful. So, friends, just uh, a final prayer. Can you join me uh, as we pray one more time for Liam and Remy and for Nala and for Amaya? Loving God, I just pray for these precious people, for this family, that they might know uh, the challenge and comfort of your love and see its power in your life. And uh, I just pray that you would be with them in all the joys and all the challenges that lie ahead, that come uh, through parenthood. We recognize that it's not always easy, but we pray that you would give wisdom, you would give patience and strength, and that as Nala grows in mind and in spirit, that you'd feed and guide her, and that you would feed and guide Liam and Remy and Amaya also. Bless this precious family, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, we have as well just uh, one or two things uh, for each of you. So uh, we have a, a book here. Sorry, everything's falling apart. There we go. We have this uh, book uh, for... Uh, Nala, if we can hand that uh, to you. And when, um, when children are dedicated in SBC, one of the things we, we, we do as well is we plant a tree through the Woodland Trust, uh, which is just a symbol of life and a symbol of planting something uh, and an investment in the world in which you will grow up in. And Amaya, there's something for you there as well. All right. Good girl. Wonderful. And can you hold on to that as well? Wonderful. Amen. Bless you. Thank you, Nala. Great. Wow. So. Isn't it precious? I, I, I love moments like these. It felt like a, it was such a privilege. Uh, our young people and children uh, are going to go to their groups now. I'd like to take a moment to pray for you before you do. And I just think it's important, isn't it? We've, we've, we make promises uh, that as a congregation, we will uh, make this a place where our children can discover God's love particularly that's a, a, a task and a labor of love that our, our Sunday school teachers, our youth group, our rooted team take on, Katie and Hillary uh, as well. And it's so important uh, and, and a labor of love and, and great service. So can we pray for you particularly before, before you go? So I just want to pray. I pray, for, um, I pray for Nala and for Amaya and for every child and every young person in our church who is going to uh, uh, go out to their groups now and uh, is going to be uh, learning of you. I pray they discover your love. And I thank you for the people who will have worked really hard on planning sessions, conceiving them, wondering how uh, they will all pan out. Would you bless them as well as they uh, just invest and give time and energy into our young people's lives. This is so important. And I pray for us as well, for the people who uh, are staying here, as uh, we uh, uh, learn about you and reflect on your word. Would you help us also to grow in our knowledge of you and our love of you? And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. So if you want to uh, go to your groups, this is the moment. Great. Thank you. A few moments time but I have a couple of announcements uh, a couple of bits of news uh, to bring uh, first of all 
Uh, just a reminder that it's our four o'clock service uh, this afternoon when uh, Don Axel is going to be speaking on John 20 uh, and the theme of power uh, for living. And uh, this is always a really uh, good service and uh, just a, a time to come together, uh, enjoy a, a traditional time of worship and reflect on God's word and uh, to get together for tea uh, and refreshments afterwards. So please do join us. Uh, and pray for Don, who stepped in at short notice and is preaching at Godstone, uh, actually, uh, this morning. So we, we pray for him uh, as we pray for ourselves, as we reflect on God's word. And then I just want to say something about two services, two events, which are coming up in two weeks' time on the 25th uh, of June. So our morning service is going to be uh, a little bit different, and it's going to be uh, a service when we'll hear from Open Doors, who are uh, a terrific organization who do uh, just wonderful work in supporting the persecuted church uh, across the world. Some of you may have heard of the World Watch List, which comes out every January and uh, is, is a list of countries in the world where it's hardest to be uh, a Christian. And Mark Libbard, who is the London Church Relationships Manager, uh, is going to be preaching that uh, morning at SPC. And in the evening, uh, we're going to have another Sunday night theology, something we do every so often, thinking a little bit more deeply about subjects. And our speaker then is going to be Sue Richardson from the Just Money Movement, helping us reflect particularly on issues of tax justice uh, and economic justice and how, as God's people, we respond to uh, respond and pray and advocate uh, for uh, a better way. And then my, my final announcement is uh, something about BMS. And uh, I want to say a few words after we've watched uh, this video, which is coming up next. Thanks. What is mission? It's over 200 years of matching God's word with deed. It's our storied Baptist history and a world still in need. We're shaped by our past as we look to the future. It's you and it's us. It's we working together as BMS World Mission, uniting believers to change the world. Will you join us? In over 30 countries, from cities to the most remote places, we tackle injustice and suffering in desperate places. We walk with refugees and those forced to leave home. We share the good news of Jesus where it's never been known. And why do we do all that we do? To make real the fullness of life and the hope that knowing Jesus will bring. Changing the world is no small task, but through prayer, through partnership, through giving, we'll do more than all we can imagine. Through giving, we'll do more than all we can imagine or ask. Together, we let children be children by building pathways to school. We care for God's planet and so grow, reap food for all. We deliver aid when disaster hits and help prepare for the worst. We plant churches and seedlings to nourish spiritual thirst. We train local medics to heal lives marked by deep strife. We see communities flourish and improve quality of life. Together, we can do all this. And to do it all, we need you. Because while God calls us, we'll answer. Until his work is through. It's just a, a short video and an introductory video, and it just gives a little bit of the flavor of the work, the brilliant work which is done by BMS World Mission, who are... Uh, I, I guess you could think of them as almost the overseas arm of the Baptist Union. And uh, they've done terrific work for over 200 years and often been, if you like, a, a leader of change uh, within our union uh, as well. Every Baptist church actually has uh, a BMS sort of church partner or a link missionary. We partner with a lady called Joy Ransom. Uh, we sometimes uh, see distribute her prayer letters uh, and so on. You will hear her mentioned. Joy's actually finishing in her work in Nepal uh, this summer, but she's going to be speaking at SBC on a Sunday morning in October. We'll have a chance to, to hear more about that. But one of the really uh, simple ways that each one of us can support BMS and remember them 
is through something called the BMS birthday scheme. And uh, the way that this scheme works is, is very simple but very effective, that uh, if you enroll on your birthday each year, uh, somebody from church uh, will send you a birthday card uh, and remind you about the birthday scheme and just ask you out of whatever you've received, uh, whatever gifts you may have had, would you like to give something back, just a small token back uh, for, for BMS? Uh, and it's good, isn't it, maybe at a time when we're being blessed and we're, 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 we're kind of receiving gifts from others uh, to be able to give something back. Uh, Barbara Burns, uh, I hope Barbara uh, is watching, uh, I'm sure she will be. Barbara did a tremendous job at ministering this scheme for years. Uh, it's been fantastic. Uh, and she has now handed over to Rosemary. I don't know if you could just wave your hands, Rosemary, or hey, thank you, Rosemary. Uh, so we're really, we're really grateful that Rosemary Annan, uh, thanks Rosemary, has taken this on. And like I say, it's, it's a very simple but very effective way uh, of giving something back. And we have leaflets here uh, about the scheme. Uh, and I really encourage you, uh, if you have time, take this away or have a conversation with Rosemary. Uh, it's just a simple way of giving something back uh, on a regular basis. And thank you, Rosemary, so much for, for, for taking this on. We're going to hear from Scripture now. And uh, Kay and Ruth uh, are going to bring us readings, one from the Psalms and one from a passage from Colossians that we'll be thinking about this morning. Thanks, Ruth and Kay. Thank you. Good morning. The first reading is from Psalm 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates his, on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. We now read from Colossians chapter 2. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the pr basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him, you are also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive in Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the written code with its, legislation, its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them, by the cross. 
Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to religious festivals, a new moon, a celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen and his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. He's lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why, as though you belong to it, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all destined to perish with use because they are based on human commands and teachings. Such regulations, indeed, have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Amen. Thanks, Ruth and Kay, and uh, we'll pray. Our loving God, come now, we pray. And uh, speak to us by your spirit. Help us to know and to understand uh, more of you as we reflect on your word. And may what stays with us from this moment only be what is from you, only what is of you. Any human thoughts or any uh, insights only of me, would they just pass from our minds quickly? I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Um, well, I, I hope you've had a good week, and uh, oh, I think uh, somebody found this picture, and they said they were going to put it up on the screen, uh, and uh, I didn't actually, but um, uh, it, this was a labor of love for me, uh, so I, I thank those who did it, uh, and I uh, acknowledge that love, um, <clears throat> and uh, what can I say, next time I'm preaching a sermon on years in the wilderness, or... Uh, endurance for faithfulness, and finally having a reward. I've got the illustration uh, ready to hand. Um, and apologies to any Fl uh, Fiorentina fans who are, who are in the church today. Um, anyway, Colossians 2. Um, I want to talk about this uh, in just a moment. But before that, um, I'm going to show a couple of pictures in just a minute. Uh, which I think are a sort of helpful way of uh, getting into to think about this passage. Um, before I show the pictures, you might want to have a think. I, I don't know how confident uh, you are about driving, uh, and particularly about driving in, in busy places, uh, or even driving abroad. First time I ever drove abroad was in France. And it was in the middle of Paris. We, we flew to Paris and had a few days there. And then the idea was to pick up a, a hire car and, and drive south. We picked up this hire car from Montparnasse uh, railway station. And when you come out of Montparnasse, there's a roundabout that you immediately come onto with eight entrances and exits. And I can still remember driving around this, and it told me to take the fifth exit out of it, but I didn't know which one I'd come on to, so I didn't know which was the fifth one, driving round and round and sort of descending into a, a circle of, of, of gloom. But uh, with all of that in mind, you might want to look at these two pictures. They're a little bit grainy, but hopefully we can see them. Uh, and just have a think, which, which one of these... Uh, Luke safer, and which one would I prefer to drive through? Uh, and the one on the left, if you can see, is pretty conventional. It's uh, uh, got zebra crossings. It's, it's kind of like a crossroads-type junction. Uh, and then the other one is um, a bit more freewheeling, it would appear. There's still some road markings, but there are pedestrians around. There are cyclists. Uh, they've replaced the zebra crossing. 
uh, with uh, this, this very large and, and attractive roundabout. And uh, the second picture, the one on the right looks uh, a bit more uh, chaotic, actually, which raises the question of which one we think uh, would be safer. And uh, you might be surprised to know that it's actually the traffic layout on the right. So uh, these are pictures which are taken from a town called Drachten uh, in uh, the Netherlands. And uh, the newer traffic arrangement, which was brought in a couple of years ago, uh, is the work of uh, a Dutch engineer called Hans Mondeman. And a uh, really fascinating guy. He actually died uh, a few years ago. But he came up with an approach to designing towns and cities and uh, traffic layouts that at first seems quite counterintuitive. <clears throat> but his big idea was get rid of as much clutter as possible from roads. Get rid of markings, get rid of traffic lights, get rid of signs. Because his idea was that all of those things reduce our awareness of what's actually going on around us. And they stop us from thinking for ourselves. And this is how he uh, explained the theory himself. When you don't exactly know who has right of way, you tend, he said, to seek eye contact with other road users. You automatically reduce your speed. And so you take greater care. Now, it hasn't caught on everywhere. I wonder if one of the reasons why it hasn't caught on everywhere is just because it seems too big a risk. It, it seems like too crazy a thing at first sight to actually ha have a go at doing. But where it has been tried, it works. It's been found to be a success. So here's another uh, picture. This is from the UK. This is Exhibition Road in Kensington, uh, if you've ever come across it. And uh, it's sometimes referred to as a naked street. Uh, or a shared space. So cars and uh, pedestrians mix there on equal terms. And what they find is there's been uh, a significant fall in speed and in accidents. And again, it seems to bear out what uh, Hans Mondeman uh, says is, is his big theory. Listen again uh, to one more comment. See, he says the problem is we're losing our capacity for socially responsible behavior. The greater number of prescriptions, or you could say the greater number of rules, the more people's sense of personal responsibility dwindles. In other words, the more that you tell people what to do and give them lots of instructions and rules to process, the less that they actually think uh, for themselves. And I find myself thinking about this story. I came back, I read it a few years ago, but it came back when I was reading Colossians 2. Because I think Colossians 2 uh, raises a really profound uh, question, an important question, which is basically, how do you help someone become a better Christian? You know, how do you help someone get to know God more and follow him more? And there are, there are different approaches you can take. Uh, and... Um, one of the most obvious seems to be this, and it's an approach which I've come across quite a few times in my time, and uh, at its heart is basically uh, just come up with lots of rules for people to follow. In each and every situation, here's the thing that you've got to do, and here are things not to do. Here are people not to spend time with, here are things not to watch, here are things not to drink, we might be familiar with that old line, uh, well, how does it go? We don't smoke or dance or chew, and we don't go out with girls who do. Uh, that was uh, a line I was familiar with back in the day. But I want to talk about what I think is, is just a fundamental approach with this problem. And it's the fundamental sort of, or fundamental problem with this approach. And it's, it's the problem that Paul talks about in Colossians 2. You read Colossians 2 and you realize there's nothing new. There's nothing new in this approach. But Paul suggests for us that it doesn't work. And this is what he tells us right at the end of the chapter. Let me remind you of what he says. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why 
as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. And such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, their harsh treatment of the body. But they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. In other words, says Paul, you can focus on rules all you like, and you can focus on all these external outward signs, but it won't get you very far. Because um, sticking to rules doesn't bring about an inner change. It doesn't get you here. As Paul says, it, it doesn't restrain sensual indulgence. Now, that's a bit of a mouthful. What does he mean? Um, well, it seems to me Paul is talking here about just our desires and uh, our primal instincts, if you like, and the basic longings. And it's these things. It's what we want. It's what we love. It's what we care for uh, that needs to change. I always remember when I, I, I think about this topic, something I read a number of years ago is by a guy called James Smith, uh, and, uh, a Canadian uh, academic writer on discipleship. Uh, and he says this, he says that if you, you just go around telling people about rules and things to do and how to follow Jesus, it's like uh, taking a cup of water and pouring it into someone's head and thinking that will put out a furnace in their heart. It's a good way of thinking about it. Because it's our hearts. It's our hearts. It's what we love and we care for that uh, needs to change. And if we're going to grow, we don't get to that place of growth by sticking to rules. Because you can keep the rules, but you'll still be kicking against them inside. And you'll be pulled every which way. But you might not find peace. And it's no way to live. It's not how Jesus wants us to live. He's something so much better for us. And I just want to explore this this morning. And I'm going to do something a bit different. Again, it might seem a bit counterintuitive. What I want to do is actually start from the end of the passage uh, and work my way back. So we've read the closing verses of Colossians 2. And uh, we'll we'll kind of go back from there uh, and discover a bit of the logic and how Paul gets to this conclusion. So what does Paul say about how we change? If it's not about rules and regulations. How do we make this change? And uh, there are just two uh, important principles that I want us to explore. And uh, I I think they're both sort of connected to what we looked at last Sunday, uh, actually, as well. But this this theme uh, that we're trying to explore at the minute, what does it look like to have habits that center us on God? So two things. And first of all, Paul talks about uh, connectedness to Jesus. It's just what I want us to explore for uh, a a little bit. And we read about this. You can go back, you can look at the passage in verses 16 uh, to 19. And when you look at those verses, in part, they seem to be just a bit like another rant almost about all of these people who are focusing uh, on external stuff. And he, 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 he talks, you might remember from the reading, you know, about the people who focus on what to eat and what to drink and what days to have celebrations. So these are clearly disputes. And Paul talks about them in other letters. They're clearly not just an, an issue for the Colossians. Uh, they're disputes that, that um, are coming up in churches. How many rules do you keep? And, and they're also problematic because once you've got rules and once you've got regulations, it's kind of like a pretext by which some people can control other people's lives uh, and have a go at them. And, and Paul talks about this, and he talks about people who focus on these externals and, and who are concerned with uh, keeping up appearances. And then he says this. The thing is, he says, they've lost connection with the head. They've lost connection with Jesus, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. So Paul, I think, is saying, if you're going to change, uh, this is what matters most. Remember, we, we, we found ourselves last week talking about Paul, and he says, what matters most is knowing Jesus knowing Jesus Christ and him crucified. And uh, 
He seems to be saying something similar here. And uh, just remember again the context in which he's writing. You've got all these people and they've come preoccupied with all these other issues. You know, what to eat, timing of celebrations. And then Paul says, you know, these things don't matter. And even more than the fact that they don't matter, they can almost be a distraction. Because my big preoccupation becomes, oh, what should I eat today? Or what should I drink? Or what day is it? And what should I be doing? And it just causes us to lose sight of Jesus. Being in relationship with him and, and asking him in and staying close to him, praying through the day. So I just raise as a question, you know, what does this actually look like in practice? Just one suggestion. I offer it to you. Um, I mean, what I've always found helpful in my life is just starting the day in prayer, starting the day by reflecting with Scripture. And there are lots of um, helpful resources for doing this. Uh, there are some resources here I've put up from uh, Bible Reading Fellowship and uh, Scripture Union. Uh, really excellent notes, and you can get them on smartphones. You can get them uh, sent to you on paper. I know a number of us here use something called the Lectio 365 app. It's, it's, it's also very helpful to a number of us. But uh, just to share for a moment, something I do in the mornings is um, I use a pattern of prayer uh, from the Northumbria community, which is a kind of Baptist monastic uh, movement. Uh, it's a set of prayers called their morning office. And part of the pattern of prayer is what they call the canticle. Well, and a canticle is just a traditional word for a song of prayers. And let me read to you the canticle, which... Uh, which the Northumbria community invites people to pray every morning. This is how it goes. Christ as a light, illumine and guide me. Christ as a shield, overshadow me. Christ under me, Christ over me, Christ beside me on my left and my right. This day be within and without me, lowly and meek, yet all powerful, and be in the heart of each to whom I speak, in the mouth of each who speaks unto me, just this day be within and without me, lowly and meek, yet all powerful. Christ is a light, Christ as a shield, Christ beside me on my left and my right. That's beautiful, isn't it? That's a good prayer. And it, it comes from the Celtic tradition. St. Patrick's breastplate, we might be familiar with it, has quite a similar feel. Now, you know, for me, I find, and I'm not, it's not like me standing here saying I've got this all sussed. I just want to talk about what I find helpful. But this is a moment to invite Jesus into the day. And I find it hard sometimes, because when I'm saying this prayer, you know, I'm often thinking about what's lying ahead of me, What's in the diary? I might know that I've got meetings with people and I'm not looking forward to them. There might be people who I'm going to encounter and it might not be easy. But when you pray this prayer, you're being made to think, okay, am I, am I going to pray in a Jesus-shaped way or am I going to be Christ-like to these people? Am I even going to be humble enough to acknowledge that they might be Jesus speaking on to me? How am I going to look out for him? And it's not a set of rules. It's not a way of kind of gaming out the day. What am I going to do and how am I going to approach things? Just an invitation for Jesus to be present. And through me and through others. Really important to hear that, you know, be in the heart of everyone who speaks on to me. Because I'm reminding myself, it's not all about me. It's going to be about other people who I'm going to encounter. And you say a prayer like this. And after a while, you find it goes to work on you. And, and you carry it. There are copies of the prayer uh, on the uh, uh, sort of window ledge uh, as you go out to get coffee. Pick one up if that would be helpful to you. And check out the whole of the Northumbria community's pattern of prayers through the day. They're, they're all available online and, and very helpful. So that's just one principle that, that, that Paul offers us. Be, be connected to the head, to the body. And isn't that interesting? He talks about the head, Jesus, and the body being of ligaments and sinews. I mean, it's very organic. It's not about a process. It's very organic. 
So he talks about being connected to Christ, and then it's just one other thing that he speaks about here, uh, which I reflect on, and uh, it's the practice of dying to ourselves and being born again in Christ. It's dying to ourselves and being born again, and uh, none of this is, is new uh, or radical. You know, this is new news today, but it's so important, and we need to remind ourselves of it. And Paul talks about this uh, in, in verses 8 to 12. And again, remember the context he's writing in. He's writing to these people where um, there, there are some, some folks in the church, and they're trying to bolt on these extra elements or, or practices and telling people that, that these are essential to living for Jesus. And we're not quite sure who these people were, but, but, but what the practices were, but we get a few clues. So in verse 8, Paul says this, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Now, there are some people who have written about this verse uh, and who've looked into it and who actually suggest that there might be a, a kind of pun going on in the original Greek in which Paul writes his letter to the Colossians. So this is it's quite interesting that the Greek word that Paul uses for taking you captive uh, is this word, syllagogio. And it sounds very similar to another Greek word, synagogue, which is the word for synagogue, which is the word for a Jewish place of worship. So it might be that Paul is punning because he's like that, and he's kind of saying these people who are taking you captive or, or these sort of Jewish-like practices that sound good and sound plausible and these people who are trying to enforce them, there's nothing good that comes in that. They're, they're, they're trying to take you captive and be wary of it. And that sort of makes sense as well when you look at what he goes on to say next. He talks about circumcision in verses 11 uh, and 12. Maybe there are some people in this church who are saying, well, if you're going to be uh, a Christian uh, and come into this movement which is emerging out of Judaism, you've got to be circumcised. And Paul then says, well, that's not necessary because if you've come to Christ, in him you were also circumcised with the circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And the thing is, you could look at that and you could just say, well, it's, it's just a comment on rituals. It's just like a comparison between circumcision and baptism. But actually, he's talking about something far deeper. And what he's saying is, following Jesus, it's, it's like a kind of death. We, we talk this language of, of, of dying to ourselves. I mean, what, what does that mean? It was really helpful we sang that song about surrendering all at the beginning. Because I think really that's what Paul is talking about. There's, there's something here just about... We give ourselves fully to Jesus, and uh, it's not a one-off process. Just every day, at the start of the day and through the day, I've just got to say, I know that there are things that I want and, and things that I want to have for myself and grab for myself and get for myself, and my ego and my desires uh, are always at work and at play. But I've got to keep on laying this down and saying, Jesus, day by day, you know, I've got to decrease and you've got to increase and have your way. It's what it's about. And when you do that, you find that you might be laying down some stuff, but you're being given back more than you can imagine by him. I, um, I read uh, this little book a couple of weeks ago, and uh, if you're looking for something to read over the summer, I, I, I couldn't... Uh, recommend it more. It's, uh, it's by an American pastor called John Stark. He came out a few months ago. It's called uh, The Secret Place of Thunder uh, and talks about, uh, as he says, trading our need to be noticed and trading what other people think about us for a hidden life in Christ. Very just pastoral, lovely book. And he, he writes very eloquently and movingly, John Stark, at one point about this process of, of dying to ourselves. I, I wanted to share it with you. He says, we experience 
a pattern when this happens of uprooting and dying to the kingdoms and promises of this world in order to become alive to something deeper. You know, you become alive to something deeper. And just as our family and friends will bury our bodies in the dirt when we die, like sowing a seed, expecting Christ to transform our bodies into glory, we are also sowing our death to the promises of this world and expecting Christ to do something miraculous with it, which he will, which he will. And you know, this is not easy. This is costly stuff. There will be times when this might mean walking away from things which seem attractive. It might mean walking away from the possibility of earning more or achieving more or being noticed more. But in all of this, Christ will be with you. And to use the language of Colossians 2, he will be building you up and he will be strengthening you and he will take you to the place where you will overflow with thankfulness. Paul says it will be so. To use the language of Psalm 1, you'll flourish like a tree that's planted by waters. And you know, we're coming to an end. I just want to ask us to think about this. This is important stuff, and and I don't want to be misunderstood. I'm, I'm not saying that rules and regulations are completely unhelpful. And I'm not saying that we don't need to change as people. I'm just saying we do need to change but the question is how. And, and it can be so attractive, I think, just to be given a template sometimes and be told, you don't need to think for yourself. You will have it all ordered. You will have it all worked out. But it just doesn't help us change. It doesn't produce lasting change. And um, let's be honest. What we're talking about here, it's stuff we all grapple with every day. It's an everyday process of coming to Jesus and saying, Jesus, what stands today uh, between me and you and me growing to be more like you? And just, Jesus, what choices do you want me to make uh, as I listen to you? You know, So just try and be in conversation with him. What do you want me to do today that takes me a bit further away from my old self and a bit nearer to you? And I just want to say... You know, particularly, friends, maybe there are some of us here today and uh, we're thinking, you know, there's stuff in my life and I struggle with it. I feel like I go through a cycle all the time of doing stuff and regretting it and I wish I could change. I just want to say, I think if you know God's love more and you can seek to love him more, particularly you know his love more, that'll help you change. See that as your starting point. And there are people here who'll help you, who'll talk to you about that, and who can pray about that with you. And as we do this, as all of us do this, he'll be at work. He's good, he's faithful. He keeps his promises. And we'll find that we've chosen well. Shall we be still? And, uh, and shall we pray? Well, loving God, these are... Uh, they're big things to think about today, important things uh, to think about. Just this principle, how do we best uh, live for you? And I, I pray for all of us, uh, taking a moment, uh, you know, to, to pray for all of us, but those of us in particular kind of situations and circumstances, maybe there are some of us and we've come here today and I don't know, we, we, we've tried to keep certain rules or we've, we've tried to change and maybe we just feel regret uh, and we find it doesn't get us anywhere and, and we almost feel worse than we were when we started. And we just think, can, can, can I ever kind of break this cycle in my life? And I just pray that if that's us, whether we've prayed to you lots about this or whether we've prayed to you not much at all, whether we see ourselves as people of faith or, or we're just here at church for the first time, just pray you'd help us with this stuff. And help us to invite you in and say, Jesus, just help me discover your love and your love that helps me to change uh, and and help me to to respond to your love by uh, every day just trading in some of my old desires for a desire to follow you. Help me with that. And I pray you help us as well just in this work of... uh, seeking to be connected to you. I pray for the conversations we're going to have with one another after this service or during the week. I pray that you'd help us to be 
just alive to you, Jesus, alert to you, just thinking all the time, how might you be speaking to me through someone else? Or if there's someone else who's struggling, what do you need me to do to, to show your love and, and be you to that person, to be your body, to be your hands and your feet, and uh, to say your words and share your love and offer even an embrace that might speak of your love. So help us, please, in all of this. Help us, please, because we do love you and we want to love you more. We pray these prayers in your name. Amen. Amen. Thanks. We're going to stand to our feet and sing our two final songs. How deep the Father's love for us. Can you feel his love? Yes, there's some nods there. His love is, is, is deep and it's for us.
Thank you so much. Friends, uh, thank you for joining us. And please stay on. Uh, please uh, enjoy conversation. Uh, there'll be tea and coffee served, cold drinks uh, as well. And uh, please don't forget to have a conversation with Rosemary about the birthday scheme. Those leaflets are there and copies of that morning office and uh, the four o'clock service. It'd be wonderful uh, to see you there also. Perhaps I can just finish by um, saying as a blessing upon you the words of that prayer uh, I spoke earlier. I pray that you would know, friends, today Christ as a light to illumine and guide you. Christ as a shield overshadowing you. Christ under you, Christ over you. Christ beside you on your left and your right. This day would you find him within and without you, lowly and meek, yet all powerful. Be in the heart of each to whom you speak and in the mouth of each who speaks unto you. This day would you find him within and without you, lowly and meek, yet all powerful. Christ is a light, Christ as a shield, Christ beside you, on your left and your right. Friends, let's go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. <laughs>